In this presentation, <clears throat> we will consider the parables that are found in Matthew chapter 13. I would encourage you to read the chapter before listening to the presentation, because then you'll have the details and before you listen to the insights and commentary that I give. Those who are listening in podcast form, audio format only, this is a presentation I do on YouTube, and it has slides with it in case you ever want to see those that accompany this and the things that I quote or read from it. You can see that on my YouTube channel, Coming Unto Christ, by Michael S. Clough. First of all, let's start out with why Jesus spoke in parables. Number one, many doctrines are reserved for the faithful. Not all people in all ages and under all circumstances are prepared to receive the fullness of all gospel truths. The Lord gives his word to men line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, confirming their hope, building each new revelation upon the foundations of the past, giving his children only that portion of his word which they are able to bear. Number two. Parables hide gospel doctrines from those whose hearts are hardened. See Matthew thirteen ten through 13 Jesus is simply practicing what he has been preaching. In the Sermon on the Mount, he told the twelve they were to go forth into the world, preaching the gospel, call upon men to repent, and invite them to join the church. They were instructed, however, to keep the mysteries of the kingdom within themselves and not to give that which was holy unto the dogs or cast their pearls before swine. Jesus told them that they would not receive that which they themselves were scarcely able to bear. And if they gave gospel pearls to the wicked and godly, such unbelieving and rebellious people would first reject the message and then use the very truths they had heard to rend and destroy and wreak havoc among those whose faith was weak. Number three, parables reveal truths to those whose hearts are opened and receptive. Quoting Matthew thirteen fifteen to seventeen, for this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand with their hearts and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have not desired, have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. Number four, teaching in parables is an act of mercy. To offer truths to wicked and ungodly creatures, which they would most assuredly reject, is to do more than cast pearls before swine. It is to make possible a greater condemnation upon those who reject the greater light. And then number five, it was to fulfill prophecy. Quoting Matthew thirteen thirteen through 14. Therefore speak I them, therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seen not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophet of Isaiah, or Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and ye shall not perceive. So those are five reasons why he spoke in parables. Oh, I'm sorry, and in number six, parables open the door to add light and knowledge. For the righteous, they will study, ponder, pray, and seek further enlightenment. As, the attune, as they attune themselves to the Spirit, he can teach them the full meaning and significance of the parable in this way and in this way learn more of the Savior and his gospel. With that, let's take a look at Matthew chapter 13, the parables of the sower, the wheat and the tares, the grain of mustard seed, the leaven, a treasure hidden in a field, the pearl of great price, and the net cast into the sea. What I'm going to do next to explain these parables or to go over them is 
to give the explanations that the Prophet Joseph Smith gave in Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, pages 94 through 102. I'll just read some of the segments from there. He gives some very instructive comments concerning these parables and what they mean. He saw a progression in them concerning the church in Christ's day, and then that the parables also talk about the restoration of the gospel in his day. So let's look at the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. Quoting Joseph Smith, I shall now proceed to make some remarks from the sayings of the Savior recorded in the 13th chapter of his gospel according to St. Matthew, which in my mind affords us afforded us as clear an understanding upon the important subject of the gathering as anything recorded in the Bible. So he saw in these parables teachings about the gathering in the latter days, the gathering of Israel. Joseph then reads Matthew 13, 3 through 9, the parable of the sower, and then he reads Matthew 13, 10 through 12 as follows. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? I would here remark that the them made use of this inter inter interrogation is a personal pronoun which refers to the multitude. He answered and said unto them, that is, unto the disciples, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, that is, unbelievers, it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. We understand from this saying that those who had been previously looking for a Messiah to come, according to the testimony of the prophets, and were then at that time looking for a Messiah, but had not sufficient light on account of their unbelief to discern him to be their Savior, and he being the true Messiah, consequently they must be disappointed and lose even all the knowledge, or have taken away from them all of the light, understanding, and faith which they had upon this subject. Therefore, he that will not receive the greater light must have taken away from him all the light which he hath. And if the light which is in you becomes darkness, behold, how great is that darkness. Therefore, says the Savior, speak I to them in parables, because they see not, they seeing, see not, and hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. Now we discover that the very reason assigned by this prophet why they would not receive the Messiah was because they did not or would not understand, and seeing, they did not perceive. For this people's hearts is gra wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But what saith he to his disciples? Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear, and have not heard them. We again make remark here, for we find that the very principle on which the, upon which the disciples were accounted blessed was because they were permitted to see with their eyes and to hear with their ears that the condemnation which rested upon the multitude that received not his sayings was because they were not willing to see with their eyes and hear with their ears, not because they could not and were not privileged to see and hear, but because their hearts were full of iniquity and abominations. As your fathers did, so do ye. The prophet, he's referring to the prophet Isaiah, foreseeing that they would thus harden their hearts, plainly declared it. And herein is the condemnation of the world, 
that light hath come unto the world, and men choose darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. This is so plainly taught by this Savior that a wayfaring man need not mistake it. Now, an explanation of the parable of the sower, Joseph Smith continues. But listen to the explanation of the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and cast, catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. Now mark the expression, that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. Men who have no principle of righteousness in themselves, and whose hearts are full of iniquity and have no desire for the principles of truth, do not understand the word of truth when they hear it. The devil taketh away the word of truth out of their hearts, because there is no desire for righteousness in them. But he that receiveth seed in stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receive it, yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. But when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also that receiveth seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. And he becometh unfruitful, because he that receiveth seed unto good ground is he that heareth the word, and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit, and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Thus the Savior himself explains unto his disciples the parable which he put forth, and left no mystery or darkness upon the minds of those who firmly believe on his words. We draw the conclusion, then, that the very reason why the multitude, or the world as they were designated by the Savior, did not receive an explanation upon his parables, was because of unbelief. To you, he says, speaking to his disciples, it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, and why? Because of the faith and confidence they had in him. This parable was spoken to demonstrate the effects that are produced by the preaching of the word, and we believe that it has an allusion directly to the commencement or the setting up of the kingdom in that age. Therefore we shall continue to trace his sayings concerning this kingdom from that time forth even to the end of the world. So Joseph is saying that this parable is that the kingdom of God, the church, was set up in the time of Christ. Some would hear it, some would not, some would come in and join, then the cares of the Lord would choke them out, and so forth. And so this part of this first parable was referring to the kingdom of God, the church of Jesus Christ, set up in the time of Jesus Christ. Now the parable of the tares. Another parable he put forth, put he forth unto them, saying, which parable has an allusion to the setting up of the kingdom in that age of the world also. The kingdom of heaven is likened to a man which soweth good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat, and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, dost thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, least while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barns. Now we learn by this parable not only the setting up of the kingdom in the days of the Savior, which is represented by the good seed, which produce fruit, but also the corruptions of the church, which are represented by the tares, which were sown by the enemy, which his disciples would fain have plucked up 
or cleanse the church of if their view had been favored by the Savior. But he, knowing all things, says not so, as much as to say your views are not correct. The church is in its infancy, and if you take this rash step, you will destroy the wheat or the church with the tares. Therefore, it is better to let them grow together until the harvest or the end of the world, which means the destruction of the wicked, which is not yet fulfilled, as we shall show hereafter in the Savior's explanation of the parable, which is so plain that there is no room left for dubity upon the mind notwithstanding the cry of the priest parables parables figures figures mystery mystery all is mystery but we find no room for doubt here as the parables were all plainly elucidated the parable of the church in the last days and again, another parable he put forth unto them, having an allusion to the kingdom that should be set up just previous to or the time of the harvest, which reads as follows. So this next parable, Joseph Smith is saying that Christ is now moving in his timeline to the restoration or the kingdom of God that would be restored in the latter days for the final harvest. And so he now gives this parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is of the greatest among herbs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Now we can discover plainly that this figure is given to represent the church as it shall come forth in the last days. Behold, the kingdom of heaven is like unto it. Now what is like unto it? Let us take the Book of Mormon, which a man took and hid in his field, securing it by his faith to spring up in the last days, or in due time, let us behold it coming forth out of the ground, which is indeed accounted the least of all seeds. But behold, it branching forth, yea, even towering with lofty branches and godlike -God majesty, until it, like the mustard seed, becomes the greatest of all herbs. And it is truth, and it has sprouted and come forth out of the earth. And righteousness begins to look down from heaven, and God is sending down his powers, gifts, and angels to lodge in the branches thereof. Isn't that interesting? Joseph sees in this parable that the grain of mustard seed was the Book of Mormon that was planted in the earth and came forth and is growing and is continuing to grow this day within the church. The kingdom of heaven is likened to a mustard seed. Behold, then is not this the kingdom of heaven that is raising its head in the last days in the majesty of its God, even the church of the latter-day saints? Like an impenetrable, immovable rock in the midst of the mighty deep, exposed to the storms and tempests of Satan, but has thus far remained steadfast and is still braving the mountain waves of opposition, which are driving by the tempestuous winds of sinking crafts, which have dashed and are still dashing with tremendous foam across its triumphant bow, urged onward with redoubled fury by the enemy of righteousness, with his pitchfork of lies, as you will see fairly represented in a cut contained in Mr. Howe's Mormonism Unveiled. And we hope that this adversary of truth will continue to stir up the stink of iniquity, the, up the sink of iniquity, that the people may the more readily discern between the righteous and the wicked. The Parable of the Leaven and another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was leavened. It may be understood that the church of the Latter-day Saints has taken its rise from a little leaven that was put into three witnesses. Behold, how much this is like the parable. 
It is fast leavening the lump and will soon leaven the whole. But let us pass on. Isn't that interesting? He interprets the parable of the leaven, the three measures of leaven, to the three witnesses who would help spread the gospel in the church. That would be the three witnesses to the Book of Mormon who testified that Joseph did receive gold plates and did see an angel and did, in fact, translate them. All these things spake Jesus unto the multitudes in parables, and without a parable he spake not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. Now let our readers mark the expression, The field is the world, the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. Let them carefully mark this expression, the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. Destruction of the wicked at the end of the world. Now, men cannot have any possible grounds to say that this is figurative, and that it does not mean what it says. For he is now explaining what he had previously spoken in parables. According to this language, the end of the world is the destruction of the wicked. The harvest and the end of the world have an allusion directly to the human family in the last days, instead of the earth, as many have imagined, and that which shall precede the coming of the Son of Man, and the restitution of all things spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. And the angels are to have something to do in this great work, for they are the reapers. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. That is, as the servants of God go forth warning the nations, both priests and people, and as they harden their hearts and reject the light of truth, these first being delivered over to the buffetings of Satan, and the law and the testimony being closed up, as it was in the case of the Jews, they are left in darkness and delivered over unto the day of burning. Thus being bound up by their creeds and their bands being made strong by their priests are prepared for fulfillment of the saying of the Savior. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels and shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be welling and gnashing of teeth. We understand that the work of gathering together of the wheat into the barns or the gardeners is to take place while the tares are being bound over and preparing for the day of burning. And that after the day of burnings, the righteous shall shine forth like unto the sun in the kingdom of their father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. So now he is seeing the restoration of the church and the church growing in the latter days and being gathered. All the while living amongst the tares, living amongst the wicked, while the Lord gathers the righteous out from among the tares. And so he sees this as a history of God's church, these parables. It's incredible. The treasures hidden a fill. But to illustrate more clearly this gathering, we have another parable. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and sell all that he hath, and buyeth that field. The saints work after this pattern. See the church of the Latter-day Saints, selling all that they have, and gathering themselves together into a place that they may purchase for an inheritance, that they may be together and bear each other's afflictions in the day of calamity. 
Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. The saints again work after this example, seamen traveling to find places for Zion and her stakes, or remnants who, when they find the place of Zion, or the pearl of great price, straightway sell that they have and buy it. So he sees these parables showing the gathering of the saints and trying to establish and finding the pearl of great price, which would be Zion, the city of Zion, the people of Zion. The net cast into the sea. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and set down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. For the work of this pattern, behold, the seed of Joseph, spreading forth the gospel net upon the face of the earth, gathering of every kind that the good may be saved in vessels prepared, prepared for that purpose. And the angels wait, will take care of the bad. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and cast them into the furnace of fire. And there shall be welling and gnashing of teeth. Just one comment about this parable of the net cast. Brothers and sisters, that there are all kinds of people in the church, those who are consecrated, those who are seeking righteousness, those who are lukewarm, those who are hypocrites, those who judge others, those who don't. The Savior warned us in the parable that there would be all kinds of fish in the net. There would be all kinds of people in the church. Therefore, you and I will not be justified in the last days for being offended by those in the church and leaving. Christ warned us there would be those in the church. Our goal is to focus upon the Savior, not the fish in the net. Jesus saith unto them, Have you understood all these things? They said unto him, Yea, Lord. And we, sh and we say, Yea, Lord. And well might they say, Yea, Lord. For these things are so plain and so glorious that every saint in the last days must respond with a hearty amen to them. Then saith he unto them, Therefore every scribe which is instructed in the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that is a householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure things that are old, new, and old. For the saints, for the works of this example, see the Book of Mormon coming forth out of the treasure of the heart, also the covenants given to the Latter day Saints, also the translation of the Bible, thus bringing forth out of the heart things new and old, thus answering to the three measures of meal, undergoing the purifying touch by a revelation of Jesus Christ and the ministering of angels who have already commenced this work in the last days, which will answer to the leaven which leaveneth the whole lump. Amen. So that was Joseph's interpretation. He sees in these parables that Christ was giving a history of his church, starting with the church then, and how there would be different people that joined for different reasons, and then how the tares would overcome it and it would go into a state of apostasy. But then later in the latter days, it would be restored. And the main thing that would help in that restoration is the Book of Mormon, which, like a grain of mustard seed, is considered so small in the world. It's considered insignificant by the world. But look what it has grown into and the huge tree that it has brought forth and is continuing to branch forth as we take it to the world. And then how, in the latter days, the saints are gathered and they seek Zion, a treasure hidden a field or pearl of great price. Well, Joseph clearly saw in the parables in Matthew 13 application to the destiny of the church being set up in Christ's day and the latter day gathering. 
the church in the Savior's day would be choked by the tares and driven into the wilderness, thus fulfilling the apostasy that was to come. Then in the latter days, Christ's church would be restored, with the Book of Mormon being the keystone for that restoration. The gathering of Israel of every kind among the tares of the latter days, and the obtaining and purchasing of a treasure of great worth, even Zion. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and gained a new insight to these parables. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and consider subscribing to my channel. Thank you.